So my experience with uh, credit cards here has been rather revealing, because even within the world of credit cards, you see these vast differences. And every time I travel, th the same problem keeps happening to me. I've called every single one of my banks, and I've told them in every different way that I can that I travel a lot. So I try to explain to them that if you see my credit card pop up in Southeast Asia on Monday, in Australia on Tuesday, and in Kuala Lumpur on Wednesday, and Paris the next day, that is normal behavior for me. So do whatever you will need to do to your fraud management algorithms. Um, that is my normal. And so every time I go traveling, I'll swipe my card, and then I'll see on my email that I got a missed call on my US phone number from Visa Fraud Prevention Services, asking me to verify that this was indeed a charge made on my account. And if I don't respond to that message in three days, my card gets shut down. So that I'm traveling the world with a piece of plastic that is literally worthless. <laughs> and no matter how many times I've tried to explain this, there are notes on my account that say, don't shut down this card, this is normal behavior. They can't get their head around the possibility that someone would travel to different countries and interact with foreigners. <laughs> so, um, so my credit cards are broken. But if you think about it, credit cards are broken by design. And most of us don't really think about how broken credit cards are. So let's go back and look at credit cards with clear eyes and examine all the ways in which they are broken. First of all, Credit card technology was invented in the 50s. Uh, this technology started just after the Second World War. In 1950, I believe the first card was a diner's club card. And this was essentially a plastic version of a traveler's check that had your name on it. And a member number, which at the time was a four-digit number. Um, and so this technology has now been extended into our current uh, always connected internet enabled global multipolar world but it hasn't fundamentally changed and that's why it's failing it's failing at every level because credit cards are broken by design the most fundamental way in which a credit card is broken is the fact that every time i buy something with a merchant what i'm giving them is the credentials to draw money from my account. So I'm giving them the secret keys to every merchant I interact with. And the more you use your card, the more you give your secret keys to every merchant. They then store them and build giant databases with 50 or 60 million of the secret access codes to everybody's credit accounts. And then they act with surprise and shock and dismay when a hacker comes along and steals all 60 million credit cards out of their super secret database and there are two types of companies in this world there are companies that have failed to protect their databases of credit cards and have been hacked and there are companies that will fail to protect their databases and get hacked in the future no one can stop this from happening if you put everybody's access credentials in a single database, it will get stolen. Simple as that. People will always find a way. Credit cards are broken by design because every time you do a credit card transaction, what you're doing is you're opening a channel that allows that merchant or anyone who gets that information to do a pull request, to pull from your account. But credit cards are also broken by design in another very fundamental way, which is that the credit card information doesn't stand alone. It is connected to your identity. And in order to execute a transaction, you have to provide your identifying information. You have to provide a name, you have to provide an address, uh, you have to provide additional information in many cases. And in many countries, it's not uncommon to also provide a tax number or date of birth for almost every online commerce credit card transaction. So what that means is that now you're not just exposing the credentials that can pull from your account, you're also exposing elements of your identity. 
elements that when enough of them are collected, you are now a victim of identity theft. And so credit cards expose you both to theft and identity theft every time you use them. It's really difficult to see the comparison for people who don't understand Bitcoin and to understand that Bitcoin transactions have no identity on them by design. And that, that is not a problem, that is a feature. And that when you execute a Bitcoin transaction, the transaction itself gives the specific amount of value to the merchant and nothing else. And by having that transaction, they can't go back and charge your account again. They can't pull money from your account again, because you pushed a specific value to them. That's what you signed for. You can't forge that signature. So Bitcoin doesn't expose you to theft, and it doesn't expose you to identity theft. Which means that when you operate with Bitcoin, all of the rules of the game change. If you've ever tried to build a merchant solution, an e-commerce solution, or you've tried to take credit cards, you'll notice that you have to do a lot of work to keep those cards secure. The moment you touch credit cards, every system that touches them has to be secured, firewalled, encrypted, audited, monitored, etc. And Bitcoin systems don't have to do that. I can add a Bitcoin payment system on my website, and every transaction I receive with Bitcoin, I don't have to encrypt it. It doesn't have to come over an encrypted connection. I can store it in a database. It doesn't have to be encrypted. It doesn't have to be monitored. If you go in there and you steal all of that information, you've managed to create a somewhat smaller replica of what's already on the blockchain. So what did you achieve? Nothing. You just got a small subset of Bitcoin transactions. You can look them up on the blockchain. You don't need to break into my website to get them. I can transmit those over an unencrypted <laughs> medium. What this means is that you can do a, an incredible amount of innovation with Bitcoin that you couldn't do before, because you can leave the network open to access, and you can make the e-commerce channels completely open. For example, there is a company in the U.S. that is using Chirp to do Bitcoin transactions. And Chirp is a protocol using sound. So essentially, your phone sings a little tune, almost like an old-style modem, in a frequency you can't quite hear. Uh, it's kind of like a buzzing sound. And a microphone in the merchant's um, store picks up that sound and gets the Bitcoin. Anybody else can pick up that sound too, but it doesn't matter because Bitcoin transactions are not sensitive. So you can transmit them in the open. You can write them on a poster. You can transmit them over unencrypted Wi-Fi, over unencrypted Bluetooth, low energy. You can use Chirp. You can use NFC. You can basically broadcast these transactions any way you like. You don't need to encrypt them. You don't need to protect them. That fundamentally changes the way we do payments networks, because all of that security goes away. But the most important thing that Bitcoin does in that context is it provides consumer protection. Bitcoin is consumer protection by design, because it doesn't force you to reveal your identity, and it doesn't expose your account credentials to merchants. Now, this seems hard to understand, because a lot of regulators want to regulate Bitcoin for the safety of the consumer. And quite honestly, the consumer is doing pretty fine with Bitcoin. We're safe. No Bitcoin merchant is going to get hacked and have 60 million Bitcoin accounts stolen. Right? Consumer safety on Bitcoin comes from the design of the protocol and from two fundamental concepts. One, you remain firmly in control of your money at all times. And two, you don't reveal anything sensitive when you do a transaction. Those two things together make it the most secure payment network we've ever built. If you want to hack 60 million Bitcoin accounts, you have to hack 60 million devices. There's no one place where all these keys are stored. And if, if you want to protect consumers, the best way to do that is to leave them firmly in control of their own money. 